Morning. Welcome to Voices of the Festival. Sorry, I had to start again because it was a not too good connections and then we couldn't really save it. So this is much better. Hopefully it will be okay. And I'm going to invite Beth right now. Uh, great. Uh, Beth. Let's see who is around. Beth Robert. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, as I was saying today, I'm uh, local. I'm in Savannah, so it's great to be here in town. Hi, Beth. Hello, Horace. Hey. Sorry, we have like a little late, little start uh, because uh, I had bad connection, so I had to start. Um, I don't see your image. Ah, let's uh -huh. see. Let's see if we can figure out why. Um, there. There we go. Now I see you. Oh, you look great. <laughs> you... I'm in my home in Nutley, New Jersey, and the sun is out, so feeling perky. Good. Excellent. Yeah. I'm at, and we are, you're a bit in Savannah also, right? So you're halfway there. I can't wait. This means when we're logging on today and talking that we're getting closer to being, you know, at the festival. Right. And in Savannah, so... Pretty excited. Pretty excited. excited. Yeah, we have uh, we had a, a great meeting yesterday uh, with with um, Leslie Francis, which is our PR person, and we were sharing the lineup of the festival, and everyone was very excited. And as as uh, many people may know, uh, two of our shows are um, Dai Don Enias and Don Giovanni. So that's and there's. Um, there are more shows coming up. There are two musical theater shows and and another opera, full production, and uh, all many concerts and new, very new venues. Uh, they're all venues that we love, but then we have, I think we have three or four new venues that are really fun wow. uh, performance spaces. So it's going to be really, really exciting. And we're going to officially announce it during our gala. And um, by the way, everyone, Make sure you get your tickets for the gala. It's um, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be in New York on April 26th at 6 p.m. And we have amazing singers. Um, we have several. Uh, certainly, the the um, the one of the main uh, guests we have is uh, Lawrence Brownlee. He's going oh, to be oh. presenting the the Cheryl Mills Awards to George Shelley, which is our honoree this year. Uh, so Larry is going to present the prize and perform for us. And oh, also Mark Delavan oh, and Santiago oh. Ballerini. And, and then uh, people are, are uh, young graduates from ours. Um, Ming Hao, Christopher Job, which is going to be singing the lead of Giovanni in the summer. Um, uh, Melanie Spector um, and, and many other uh, uh, performers. So it's a really, really exciting uh, gala. But we're, we're very happy and honored to have uh, Lawrence Brownlee to present the prize to George Shirley. I think it's a, it, uh, the theme of next year is legacy. And uh, that is a wonderful way of saying uh, an African-American tenor giving the prize to another African-American tenor. One of the actually the first African-American tenor to sing in lead roles at the Metropolitan Opera House with was George Shirley. And um, so they are very... Um, very happy to to continue with that uh, legacy and and to manifest it online. So, oh, that's amazing! It's amazing. You know, I I've I was trying to recall when I first came to Savannah in the program, and I think somewhere around 2015. Okay. And I mean, you know, since then I've watched so many of the singers who were there start their careers, Great. right? And and I I see them come into the program, develop, start to grow, get their materials together, figure out who they are as an artist, and get started. And now I get to enjoy it. Great. So <laughs> yeah, that is I great. get to go to the galas and enjoy everything 
and, that's and, happened. And you were being you've been a part uh, of, of the program and, and helping these people grow. Uh, you were a very very important part because um, you are one of our uh, staple voice teachers and educators, and to show. Uh, all what you do is really amazing. And, and also you have brought to, to our family a lot of your students um, so that we are very thankful for that to let us know that you need to work with this person, you need to work with this person and, and you have an amazing ear for detecting talent. So this is great to, to have. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm just glad to be a part of it. I just think exciting things are happening and just hearing you talk about it today, I'm already more pumped up. <laughs> Yeah, it's a uh, it uh, and and the season is so exciting. So uh, it's going to be really really great. Um, and all right, so so you say that you are in New York at your home. Yes, I'm in Nutley, New Jersey, oh. and That's I good. am close to Montclair, which is my new musical home. Great. Which is Montclair State University, the Cali School of Music. That's where I'm now full time on faculty. And I am loving it. Speaking great. of doing great things, we brought some of the Savannah family to Montclair. Um, so Cheryl Milnes and Maria Zubis and Fabrizio Milano came to, came to our production of Johnny Skiki and Buozo's Ghost by Michael Ching. Michael Ching was actually conducting another production at the same time, so he couldn't be with us for our production of his piece, but he did zoom on with our students and coach them through. It was, it was wonderful. Wow. It was That's really fun. wonderful. Was, so, What a great opportunity for them also to just to work with Michael directly. And, and I know he was doing it at, at Florida Grand. Right. And he was doing the same. He was conducting the same uh, duo, let's put it that way, the same double bill. Right. And, uh, and so, but I'm glad that they, your students got to work with him. And, and that's, that's really fun. That was wonderful. And they gave a wonderful pre-talk before the opera and shared stories of the, the production and, and gave some insight to all of our um, donors and people who attended that pre-talk. Mm -hmm. And that made it even more special. So oh. I, I'm very thankful to Cheryl That's... and Maria and Fabrizio and Michael. That's um, amazing. Again, that part they, of my family coming. Over. Yeah, coming to, to my new home. Great. Yeah. I'm going to put a little more light there. That's better. Um, that, that's good. So when do you start in, in, um, in Montclair? So, so I've been on the adjunct faculty before I joined full-time. So this is my second year uh, as a full-time uh, faculty member. And, um, you know, I have to say there's so many changes, and it's, it's exciting to jump into this after we've been in the pandemic and things are kind of closed down to – full throttle <laughs> and i i'm so excited about what they're doing they're inviting immersive artist residents we just had caroline shaw and one of my st singers uh sang at merkin hall in a concert with her one of her pieces um we had rhiannon giddens um we have just a huge opportunity um, for all of our students, both in the opera department and outside of the opera department. So I'm, I'm very thankful. Uh, it's a small graduate department right now. I'm hoping to keep it that way. Um, and that way everyone can get opportunities and to grow. So I'm, I'm excited because my students can come and I can say, like, we have something to work towards. We have a role to work towards, right? When you so. mean small... How many, how many students in the graduate program? So there's about 25 right now, uh, master's and artist diploma students in voice. And that is relatively small for the New York area, right? Right, it is. So, yep. so we're, we're thankful for that. Uh, and it gives everybody an opportunity. So we were able to double cast um, Johnny Skiki and Buozo. And so... It's just, I'm very thankful. It's wonderful. Good. And I have a wonderful team. I have coaches that are amazing playing everywhere. 
Uh, and coaching everywhere and all of our students get um, a private coaching every week and an opera coaching okay. in addition to their lessons. So they're really well prepared. So, you good, know. good, good. Excellent. So, and, and, and tell us, how do you start with music? How did I start with music? You know, <laughs> I started actually uh, as a clarinetist. Yeah. And I was in the wind ensemble. I grew up uh, outside of Buffalo, in a suburb of Buffalo, Clarence, New York. And they had a wonderful music program. And I started with the clarinet. And shortly after that, I thought, gee, as I'm playing in the orchestra, it looks fun what they're doing up there on stage. That looks really fun. And maybe I should audition. And so I did, and I got a role. And then someone said, you know, Beth, maybe you should take some voice lessons. And I, you know, I thought, well, I guess I could. So I was kind of late to the game in high school, taking lessons and pursuing it. So and but this was in high school. So, so you were playing in, in, the, in the pit orchestra of a high school production. That's it. Okay. Yes. And I was regularly in the band in the wind ensemble. And this wind ensemble was one of the top, if not the top in the state. So oh, wow. I was wow. a serious clarinetist. I was studying with... Um, uh, the first clarinetist in the Buffalo Philharmonic, you know, I'm working on my reeds. I've got the best instrument. <laughs> so you can imagine my shock when I could not blame my reed anymore, you know? Right. right. And it, then it was suddenly, oh, it's up to me to sing in tune. <laughs> I couldn't adjust the <laughs> right. mouthpiece. Oh, I better learn what I'm doing. So, and, you know, the other, the other thing, about the switch was I realized, hmm, six hours in the practice room by myself with the clarinet, or maybe I could spend like an hour and a half singing. That sounds a lot better. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and with other people hanging out most of the time. Yeah, right. And talking and chatting and having fun, yeah. Right. I, um, I, one of the reasons why I, I, I fall in love with um, vocal music is because hanging out with singers is so much fun. And they are, so it was, uh, I mean, I, I was a pianist. I mean, I am a pianist, I, but I was doing solo piano repertoire mostly. And then I discovered the vocal repertoire and started working with singers. And they were so inviting and so fun. And so all my friends were singers. Uh, I almost had no, no pianist friends at, at some point because I was hanging out with singers all the time. It's just, uh, and and before before you started playing it, how did you discover playing it and, and, and music? Even Well, it was, you know, it's interesting because I think it was just a part of me. Um, even though uh, my immediate family, my, my mom and my dad were not musicians, I have since met almost all of my extended family have musical skills. <laughs> okay. And um, including back, my great grandfather was an organist that played on the silent films. Oh. And he was actually quite, uh, well known and toured in, through in, the in US. Where, in the Buffalo area or? All over the US. Oh. He was uh, widely regarded. And so I started learning a little bit of the family history and realizing when I started to meet my cousins, everybody sang, everybody played an instrument, <laughs> even if it wasn't their profession. So I think it just was part of me. And then I was in a place that. You know, I grew up in a place that had a wonderful arts program and music program, and I was inspired by my teachers, right? So my te teachers inspired me, and I thought, gee, you know, watching them, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be a teacher. So I always oh. knew, like, I, I was thinking, I'd love to do that. I'd love to be a teacher. But before I could do that, all my teachers said, you got to get on stage first. Then we'll talk about Right. <laughs> we'll talk about it. But from the very beginning, um, I decided that was something I wanted to pursue. But I didn't know if it would be clarinet or voice. So when I started auditioning, I really didn't know when I went to college. And do I have the stuff? People around me are saying I have the stuff. And I was 
uh, invited to sing with some orchestras. I had no clue what I was doing, but I was already singing with the orchestras, especially summer orchestras. And um, so when I applied to schools, I think I applied to about 16 schools for voice, oh, wow. Wow. hoping I'd wow. get into a couple. And <laughs> I got into all of them. Great. And that's when I thought, maybe, maybe they're right. Because, you know, when you're growing up in a small area, you don't know really how you fit in, right? So, um, but that's what led me there. And my parents and um, musicians around me supported, supported me 100%. Great. And, and where did you go to college? So I, I went to Eastman. Uh, which is in Rochester, not far from the Buffalo area, but just far enough. <laughs> right. And I double majored in music education and performance. Uh, the administration there was very clear with me. They said, there's no way you can finish this in four years. And I said, well, I have to because I will run out of funds if I don't finish in four years. So I managed to finish both programs in four years. And um, I had to let go of the clarinet. Once I got there, I realized, no, I have to focus solely on my singing, especially as a double major. But I did get out of clarinet methods. That's one thing I was able to pass out of. <laughs> so so you, you, you were able to work? Oh, I was was able to pass out of clarinet methods. That oh. In music education, right? you right. have to I take see. violin. Well, at least I had to take violin, trumpet. I was terrible on the trumpet. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, and, and a wind instrument and percussion. Yes. Okay. So, you no know, piano? Actually, well, I passed out of that, too. And okay. I did take, I did, I didn't mention that I had had private piano lessons. I wish I had, when people ask me what's important if you want to go <laughs> in, into more of the teaching uh, element, I'm like, piano, piano, be able to play a little bit. And I can play. I was able to pass out of piano and I took private lessons, which was really hard. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, so I, I, I had a very strong musical background before I went into singing. And a lot of the young singers I met did not have that. When I got right. to Eastman, I saw a lot of the young singers didn't have a background playing an instrument or playing piano. So I was a little bit ahead uh, of, with musical training, but I was behind with the vocal training. Right, because most of them had started, I don't know, earlier. Yeah. yeah. All right. And um, and so so you you so you obviously you wanted to teach already because you were in your in I knew your, it. Uh, I knew. Yeah. Uh, in, in your um you know, double major, so you say, okay, I should do the voice and 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 so what happened after after you finished college? Well, after I finished Eastman, right, I went on for my master's degree um, and followed a teacher there uh, at Manhattan School of Music. And I worked with Marlena Mollis at Manhattan School of Music. Right. And uh, from there, that's when I started auditioning for young artists programs and, um, and, and getting out there into the real world. Um, and... You know, I from after right after my master's degree, I was a young artist with the Santa Fe Opera. So that was my first opportunity to get out there. And then um, from an audition, yeah, at Santa Fe, with. it was, was a good one to be with. Absolutely. Um, I, I started to branch out a little bit more, get some opportunities. Um, and when, I, especially when I was working on a new role, when I was working on Violetta, I was helping with the Washington Opera and singing Violetta. That's when I met Ruth Falcon, who was my mentor. 
and um and I said to her I said listen I'm I'm having some issues with my top notes and I really need help and she was my guide to understanding a lot more of what was missing with my breath and my support and that really was the moment I think when I started those things started to click for me that I realized I actually want to help other singers who are feeling this same thing and it was <clears throat> this happened after I finished my master's degree as I started working so um but Ruth was adamant she said you must be singing first sing first sing first sing first no teaching <laughs> and um this went on for a while until I did get my first teaching job and and then I was trying to juggle I was teaching at Westminster Choir College and oh, no. Ruth yeah and Ruth heard Beth you know I hear you're doing good things and I need an assistant here you're pretty close in age to my students at Manus but what do you think and we met we talked about it and I said I'd love to work with your students she had some wonderful singers and um she you know it was learning for me so I got to watch and learn and see what was happening and it was shortly after that that I joined the faculty and I was one of the youngest on a New York faculty at that time if not the youngest so I I joke about this but I really did consider dyeing my hair gray I really did <laughs> <laughs> and because there was just such a you know I was maybe one or two years older than the professional studies students right and now i'm thinking can i get some more highlights <laughs> but <laughs> but at that time um it was um an exciting exciting time and that's when i started to feel oh wow i can really make an impact and i felt the rewards of of what i was able to um help with and see the singers you know just bloom so and that's what let me down the path where i had to turn away singing contracts and focus more on teaching because what started with just a couple of students quickly <laughs> grew and grew and then i was ruth's assistant then i was at the at school and before you know it uh i was running the department wow so wow. When, when it goes you, fast. When uh, how many years after that you were you were the head of of Manis vocal department? Um, I'm trying to think. Um, maybe five years after I got there, maybe not that much. Um, it it really I got I got to Manis. I was Ruth's assistant. The program like where i am right now at montclair was very small and and um it's it's since i think a little bit bigger now than than montclair but um it was small but i had a big responsibility with ruth with her students and then having my own separate studio mm -hmm. plus my my private students so um it quickly <clears throat> it just it just kind of fell in my lap basically we need somebody right <laughs> and you're <Yeah>. there <laughs> so i stepped in and right now actually as we're talking i'm thinking about <clears throat> so my our coordinator of the voice department at montclair is on sabbatical right now dr lori mccann so oh, yeah. yours truly is stepping in for the semester <laughs> and um i've had my share of experience but it's still new to me you know this the department and the the workings of it but we're doing well good well i mean uh, you uh, you you have experience running or or running coordinating running the the vocal department in manis so it it makes sense for for you to do the the one in montclair although it feels like in montclair there's more faculty than it was in manis yes we have 
you know, we have music education, music therapy, and performance in the undergrad, and um, and in the master's degree, we also have a music ed and music therapy, um, and um, vocal performance, right? So it's the undergrad department is a little more sizable, although the performance end of it is very small. So the Cali School is a small school within a large university. I think there's about 24,000, 25,000, something like that on campus, but our school is very small. Great. I uh, I worked together with Laurie at NYU. We were faculty together at the at NYU when I first moved to New York for probably my first uh, five six years. We were, I mean, I, I worked strongly with the opera department at NYU probably uh, four years, if you know a little more. So Laurie was there, and it was it was fun to, to working with him with her there. So. Yeah, she's wonderful. I, I, I'm I so happy and thrilled for her that she has this time. Right. Uh, and uh, she's got a wonderful project that, and she's performing. Oh. So it, it's terrific. Um, and and I know that she'll be back. Right. And we'll be able to <laughs> help each other run, a, uh, uh, run the program. And um, yeah, so, and you know, Jorge, that uh, I have... Two sons who are both singers who've been to the Savannah right. program, right. and my husband. So I, I live husband, here. It, your husband is a, is a it's a great singer on, on on his own, and and of course he his most famous role is he was doing Pianji for the longest time at Phantom. Uh, That's it. And he he was you know advising one of our students, uh, Carmo, to audition for Phantom, and he also got to sing PNG at Phantom is actually the current one from Manhattan, from the, the Savannah Boys Festival. Right. So, right. so that's yeah, a, that was, a, a that fun was, one. Yeah, I feel, feel like this is the fun part of the, the job now is that I get to go and hear my students perform or I can hear somebody in the festival and say, you know what? And that's what happened with Carl. I said, Carl, you could do Phantom of the Opera. I know you're a wonderful opera singer, but you could also consider you're great on stage. You're very entertaining. Have you ever considered that? Kind of look, you know, not really. And then I said, well, I'm going to talk to my husband and let's see, let's see what we can do here. And that started the, the discussion. Of course, Carl was perfect for it. Yeah. So it, I didn't have to do anything. He just had to go do the audition. Right. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's what I enjoy now. I mean, one of my students, I just, uh, in, in January, I went to Munich to hear her sing Adele at the Staatsoper. And I've taught her, Deanna Braywick, this is, oh, Deanna. since she's been, yeah, 17 years old. Yeah. And, you know, at this point in my career, now I'm like, who's performing where? I'm getting on the plane. And I'm going. Fun. So I'm not doing the singing, right? But I'm going and enjoying my students out there performing. So literally, when I'm talking to my students, I'm like, where are you singing next? I wonder if I can go there. <laughs> fun. It's, it's both work, fun, and vacation. It yeah. is. It's mostly fun to enjoy fun. it. You know, the work, the work is always there, right? To right. prepare to get on the stage. But there, there's a time where you know you have the means and you you can enjoy it then. And I want to be a part of that. That's the, the next chapter for me. Good. I'm going to ask you a, a kind of a hard question because it's, it's hard to answer. It's not, it's not hard when you are in it. But so we are uh, we're going to make a super simplification of vocal technique, which is impossible. But, but there's always... You, you'll see when, when we start thinking about it, it's not impossible. So how would you do, how would you approach a, a student in, in the vocal element? So of course, of course, each person is different and, and the, the same way I work as a, as a coach or as a conductor, I get the material, let's say 
the person and and work towards um working at, and, and towards fixing what is not there yet or in or even uh highlighting what is there yet and it's it's the best part and uh, so it's always it's always specific yet i wanted to figure out what how would you describe uh your vocal technique that's a good question uh you know i think look i i feel like like the issues for most of my young professional singers are they have a beautiful voice, right? The voice is never the issue. What is the issue is the breath. The breath is the issue because if we don't have a good support mechanism, right, it can cause all sorts of issues. We could, if we, our breath support isn't engaged properly, we could have an unsteady air or we could have a faster vibrato or a slower vibrato, right? The speed of the air. So I, I would say if I'm going to talk about what I teach, I'm coming first from, are you engaged with the support? What is support, right? Everybody throws that word out, like support. Yeah. Matter of fact, that's what I heard as a young singer. Well, you need more support. And I thought, well, what is that? And do I, how do you do it? And what does that mean? And what I remember, trying, it was like kind of, you know. And I thought, this can't be right. It, it shouldn't feel like this so hard. Uh, so it took me a, a long time to kind of understand the balance, the buoyancy, actually, that you need. So it's an engagement and a buoyancy with the air. So you're riding the breath, right, above the tongue, on the air, and steady, instead of, right? So, so many young singers fall into the trap today of pushing, right, forcing their voice. And that is a hard thing to be able to sustain. Like, I'm, I'm working for all my students to have at least a 20-year career. So if you're forceful, and using the wrong kind of muscles and muscling incorrectly when you sing, no good. The other end, under supporting, and as I heard somebody say, just relax. And I thought, no, that's not gonna help me. <laughs> relax, no, <laughs> that's equally bad. You know, so it's, I like to call it engage. You're going to engage the breath, engage your body, Feel the resistance that you need. So I think it's not the voice that's the issue. Sometimes when I'm, I'm judging a competition, I'll hear some of my colleagues say, oh, I don't really care for that voice. And I say to myself, it's not the voice. The voice is perfectly lovely. It's how they're using their voice you don't care for. You know? Right. right. And, and so... I, I think a lot can be solved with the, the coordination between the breath and the resonance. So that's what I'm working on most every day, right? So we're finding, okay, where can we feel that resonance? We're not holding a position, but we're curving through it. So it was very confusing for me as a young singer, and I, I think – I learned a, a lot about teaching by all my mistakes. Okay. Every mistake I made, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> and, Can't and, have that. And when we talk, we, we use the air. Uh, there's, there's a breath going on. We don't think about it. We, we, we don't even think when we breathe in and we breathe breathe out. We just do it, right? Um, unless we, we become aware, but really we're not aware. And so when we're singing, we are becoming aware. So what is the, the biggest difference between breathing for talking and breathing for singing? Well, it depends on where you're speaking, right? Let's say you are actually speaking on a big stage without a microphone. Then the breath is going to be very similar with your speaking as you're singing. It, it, it'll surprise you. So if you try that, 
and just stand up without a microphone and start to feel what you need to do, you're going to say, you know what, in order for me to project in this hall with my speaking voice, I'm going to have to do the same thing. So actually, I try, you know, when I'm teaching eight hours a day, I'm very aware of my speaking voice because if I don't support it and keep it in a nice resonant place mm. at the end of the day, right? Right. Uh, right. You, I'm sure everybody has experienced that mm -hmm. if they're doing a lot of talking. Um, one of the things that um, I think it's my, it's my accent a little bit, my Buffalo accent where I feel a little yeah <laughs> comes into my speaking <laughs> somebody wrote me the other day they said all right I'm detecting an accent are you from the Midwest <laughs> and I said everybody asked me if I'm from the Midwest but no I'm from Buffalo but that that resonance I don't I'm very aware of that that I stay there and I'm supporting it so it, you know, when I'm working with a lot of music educators, mm -hmm. especially here at Montclair, who um, are going to be in the classroom many hours teaching, those are speaking voices that need to learn, right, how to keep on the support and, right. and resonance. And the resonance, yeah. yeah. And, um, and in my case, also, I, I don't get tired of talking, but uh, as you can here I have a very high resonance and very bright placement and, and it, so it's it's very easy. I, I can be loud. I'm not sure if understood because of the accent because I have an even stronger accent than yours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but they can hear me uh, very easily. So it, and and I never get tired yeah. of talking unless I yes, you I, you so yeah. have you ever had any voice lessons, Jorge? I, I did in Michigan. Michigan, uh, when I was doing my master's for conduct for piano accompanying, I knew that I was going, my, by then I was already working with singers and one of the electives I had was uh, do voice lessons because I thought, well, let, let, let's just be a student of voice for a while and see how, how that works. It was only one semester uh, and it was, it was fun to do it and uh but i think i think this comes with the package i i was always very bright and very um very masky and a lot of of talking in the in the mask that was never an issue it was always high tenor um although not high high in the singing uh, but easy in the talk i mean if i'm warm up i can and i'm singing with with you know, in the coachings and singing cues, I can easily sing B flat. Uh, oh. Not good, but uh, <laughs> but easily. So it's not that that I mean, harder than that. I never, I was never able to sing a a, a high a B natural or a high C. Uh, okay. But uh, but B flat, I can I can sing it. Uh, if I if I warm up, I remember actually in Michigan we um, we had a class that was called. Uh, coaching class and it was fantastic class for for all the companies which is working on how to coach uh, and prepare singers in especially in um, operatic repertoire mm -hmm. so we have to mm -hmm. learn how to play and sing and cue and and work with other singers and so we were learning two things we have to learn a two finale of Mozart and and the opening of Bohem. So um, I remember um, that I um, I was able to sing the high B flat in at the beginning of Natural So so that was um, that was fun. I said, oh, I have a B flat. Yeah, you have uh, a natural. You have the natural singer's resonance where you're yeah, exactly. Yeah. So one thing I can never learn is vibrato. I don't have vibrato. Oh. I don't and I. And so that's the air. Yeah, that's the air. That's the air. So my guess is your solar plexus here, yep. maybe too tight. Like your the way you're holding your support might be too high. Right. 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 So we're gonna have to work we'll, on we'll that. We'll work on that. <laughs> that will be fun. Uh, now, when you say, how would you define a good support? 
if I had to say, well, like, let's talk about it. So what should I do? And I said, again, this is such a generalization because which each person is different, right? It's like, right. how do you want to be healthy as a person? Well, it depends. I mean, tell me, tell me what you you have you have a high blood pressure you have uh, you have lower blood pressure we we'll, we'll talk about the specifics but still you can we can generate make a general concept so what is a a good support you think yeah you know people ask me all the time things like well is the support you use just for sopranos <laughs> you know like no <laughs> um you know actually Uh, working on this with Ruth, because th this was one of my um, big challenges with my own singing, you know, was uh, the approach to the top, like I was sharing with you, how to get through the passaggio correctly, and to have, be able to sing long, expansive phrases. I could move my voice easily, but the longer legato lines I was struggling with as a young singer. And, and You know, so the the technique that she passed on to me was actually more, the breath technique was George London. So it came from a lower voice, uh, mm. uh, primarily. Um, there were other influences, but uh, that's primarily where it's from. One of the things that I didn't understand as a young singer is I was always aware of the lower abdominal support. But nobody ever talked to me about intercostals, right? So, so I'm like, well, duh. I mean, where are your lungs? Are your lungs down there? No, your lungs are here. And so as soon as, literally, as soon as I started to feel what I call open the French doors, right? right. Open the French doors. I was like, hey, you know, as soon as my... Rib cage was open, my throat was open, I'm not so restricted. And then I started to understand the coordination between the lower abdominal support and the intercostal. So what I teach is that combination and a feeling of three dimensional, right? I see a lot of young singers like today when I ask them what their support is and they or how do they breathe? And they basically just stick their stomach out. They just, and I said, is that where your lungs are? <laughs> <You know? laughs> what is that? So actually what I talk about is the importance of the exhale. It's not how much you inhale, but can you exhale first? Let out all the air, feel the, contraction that you need it's a slight contraction and then inhale against it and when you inhale against it you're going to start to feel what you're leaning on the apoja right and but a lot of young singers like me i made the mistake and i wondered why i would get feedback like you know shrill there <laughs> or not quite in tune or whatever it was as a young singer. And I went mostly on my natural instincts. And I was a good musician, so I could learn things quickly. But I knew I wanted more polish. And I got so excited, I guess nerdy about, about it, <laughs> about what I could do with technique, with vocal technique. And then I saw what my students could do And when I saw if I passed it on to a student and they could surpass what I was doing professionally, then I knew it was working, <laughs> right? It's like that is the goal for, for you as a, as a teacher to see your students surpass what you're able to do. So, right. um, and, and that's how I would describe it. I, I would describe it as making sure that it's not only about the inhale. If we do... <laughs> you know, right you've everybody right. has heard don't raise your shoulders right. when you when you breathe right but same when you speak so i i actually i talk to my students a lot about their speaking voices since you brought up that conversation oh, yeah. and when i'm teaching uh vocal pedagogy 
it's part of the course, yeah. right? How, how to maintain a healthy speaking voice. So it's, yeah. it's very hard for um, for people that 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 have uh, some kind of uh, speech pattern that is not conducive to talking a long time. It's very hard to for them to make it the the, the change uh, the everyday change because that's you know that's a big change of what feels what they are and but it is possible i think right to to change the way you speak every day it, it is it is and to be very aware of how you're caring for your speaking voice because that'll translate into singing right so as you're speaking through the day if you're talking like this all day long yeah. and then uh, you're singing something in the evening <clears throat> You're gonna, it's gonna take you twice as long yeah. to warm up, right? So, with all hair, hair on the face, well, no, it was a big problem. I get tired. Yes, exactly, exactly. And there is, and, look, uh, there's uh, a lot of that. Um, do you, that, that you have cases that, uh, of students that you have asked them to change their speaking pattern and, and succeed at it? Absolutely. Um, sometimes I'll recommend a speech therapist for them to work with to have a better understanding right of how they're using their speaking voice so i i think yes speech therapy is a good way forward if people come in and they're very tired and they say i'm tired a lot my voice is tired a lot and i perceive something when they're speaking then i'm going to suggest having an evaluation with a speech therapist you're a professional voice person, right? right? So speaking is, is equally important. I think it's much more difficult to speak, like having this conversation, than sing. Oh, really? really? Okay. Yeah. If I were singing this, well, not now. <laughs> Bad then. <clears throat> I probably, I would have less feeling of fatigue. Okay. I have to be very conscious of my support and my, yeah, my resonance. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and another thing that you mentioned, and, uh, and I wanted to see if we can give a little, like, a, a very simplified, and, and I know that these simplifications are just silly uh, in a way, but it's, it's essentially a very good starting point of people to think about it, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a fun conversation. And also, it's actually very... Um, very instructing for non-singers um this conversation and, and these things that we are very used to they are they're a tall um new territory for non non-singers or non-professional musicians so and and this conversation goes to all of our our uh people yes here. yes so this, this is fascinating uh i mean we're not going to teach anyone well, how to sing in this conversation, but this is not the point anyway. <laughs> we, uh, could. we could get everybody on there. <laughs> yeah, but at, at least they have an awareness of, of what's involved and, and some of the lingo that would be fun. So you mentioned Pasaggio, and how would you um, describe that? And uh, Because another thing that is very clear to me as a coach is I can hear where the passaggio is because usually the intonation is, is complicated and the resonance is complicated. But what it is, is, is di di difficult to define. I know. I, I think some teachers believe in not even speaking to it, just pretending it doesn't exist so that you don't get it in your head. Oh, oh here it is. Passaggio is coming. I must do something. But I think it's better to just uh, call it what it is, it's a passageway, right? So when you're working on the evenness of your sound, top to bottom, you go through that passageway, and that passageway is not so wide. So it's definitely, the way I would describe our voice is kind of like an hourglass shape. So the bottom is rounder through the middle, slim but the slimmest part is the passaggio and then it opens back around to the top and i see often that a young singer will sing a, 
a scale through the passaggio and get Y. And then say, uh-oh, I can't get to the top. Right? So it's like, oh, no, how am I going to get there? So, and that passaggio is kind of like, it's just a little passage that you, you can't stay in that passage long. You pass through it. I also see a lot of singers, they hold it position in the passaggio. I'm like, no, don't hold it. Go through it. And you'll feel like it's a little taller, not wide. And the, you know, Every voice type is going to experience it. Different areas of their voice. You'll, so I know you're aware of it. But these things, these technical things, whether it's breath, uh, learning the passaggio. Uh, actually, that was, I read in Opera News once, who was it who was saying how he chooses the young artist for uh, the Met Young Artist Program is how well they sing in their passaggio. Because they know there's going to be so many beautiful voices but if they're technically not solid they're not going to hold up in the program right. so these things are important in order to become the artist you want to be right, right? so you, you these things you take care of so that then you can delve into the music making without worry without thinking am i going to sing in tune is it Am I going to have enough breath? Do I have the high notes? You take away the worry when you have a solid technique, and then you can put the heart in there, the right, the the emotion and the connection. So I wanted to just say that not only is breath a physical thing, it's also our connection to all of the emotion. So breath and emotion are one and the same for me. So Great. Well, so that's, that's very the, important. The word inspiration comes from. Yeah. Right, so. so, so you know, I think that, you know, the reason why I work so hard with my students on their technique is to make sure they have the confidence to do whatever is demanded of them. And right now, most of my young singers are not only doing the standard rep, but new music. And the demands of the new music sometimes are even greater, a wider range, more flexibility, um, right? So in difficult intervals. So we have to prepare so we're musically and technically and vocally strong enough to say, I can do that. And not only I can do that in two months, but now. <laughs> like, now I can do it. You need me for that? Yes, thank you. I will take that job, Great. right? Yeah. One thing that 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 I, I uh, um, realize is that usually technical changes doesn't need a lot of time to happen. For sometimes getting used to those changes and make them uh, like part of your normal behavior that takes longer. But fixing things usually is pretty fast, right? Usually. So look, I want the students that I pre prepare, right, to be so secure. So when you have them in rehearsal, you're not, not worried. Are they going to be singing flat in their passaggio? Right. You know they're going to have the high note. You know they have the breath. You know you can retard a little bit and they'll be there. They'll be fine, right? So right. it's it, it's that. So then ask. Whoops. I don't know what that is. Then you can ask right of all, all the other musical things that you want right yeah fantastic well thank you so much for this conversation it was fascinating and always had fun and always hanging out with you is, is just a joy so fun. thank you thank you and uh, i will uh see you during the gala and... and i wanted to just shout out i saw a few of the students students i haven't seen in a while log on to this and uh, I just wanted to shout at, out to everybody that I want to come see you sing. So <laughs> please, please tell me where you're singing. Uh, Dorothy, I saw you were on there. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's my next, my next part of this journey. Great. Enjoy. All right. I have, have a reason why to, to travel even more. That's great.
I, that's my main goal. My main goal is live performance. I know. Live performance. Right. After two years of not so much, now we are happy to be doing yes. a lot of that. 100%. Thank you so much. Okay. And, thank you. Uh, All right. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Thank you, everyone, okay. for watching. And I will see you next time at, uh, when we hear more about the Voices of the Festival. Bye, everyone.